It is a it is a great privilege once again to come in our presence to minister. Like I've always said, when I come to minister, I come, I minister to myself before I minister to others. That's what the Bible demands. You who teach others to you, not to teach yourself. We pray that the grace of God will help us to achieve and attain the holiness that we want. Today is the last day I'm taking the series from debut to sonship. This is the seventh part. Initially, when we started this series, we talked about three things that we need to do. Why these teachings was important. We said every living being needs to grow. And then we said there's always room for more growth. And then we said, if you stop growing, you start dying. So there is no debate here. Just before we get into our message uh, from baby to sonship, part seven, I want to remind us of the five things that we bring to the house of God. Your pen, your notebook, your Bible, your hymn book, and your offering. So the Bible gives us a mandate according to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, that we must come to minister that the word of God must change us or help to change us. We grow in different dimensions. So the three aspects that I talked to initially when we started the series is everybody needs to grow, every one of us, and there's room for more growth. And when we stop growing, we start dying. What, was, what is the supposed outcome of this paper to sonship? I said the result should be evident in the life. Our, li our life must be able to testify to the behavioral changes, character development. All these things, these are some of the things that help us to point to growth. That are we growing? Is the grace of God to grow. And we talked about what is righteousness? How is holiness attained? What is holiness? How is righteousness attained? These are some of the things that we are trying to address. Can one progress in holiness? We looked at all these things and that the word of God should not be taken as, um, as a novel. No, we said if we should grow. There's what we call spiritual wisdom, the word of God, which is um, delivered with the unction and illumination of the Holy Spirit, which is invested in the people that we need to grow. On the other hand, people are also fed up going to church, hearing the wisdom, natural wisdom of men, philosophies, philosophies of men, fanciful stories that titillate only their ears, but it doesn't lead them to grow to growth. It actually leads them to more carnality and worldliness, of which the logical outcome is you will not meet a lot of this. That means if you are to perish at that particular time, you will, pay, you will go straight to hell. Well, we do not wish to make anybody fear that it's hell. Hell is a real place. Yes, it is. Well, today, we are starting from babyhood to sonship. Like I said, we are finishing off. This is the last part, the seventh part. We made it seven part for strategic reasons. Seven is a whole number in numerology. So this series from babyhood to sonship, in the last few weeks, the Lord has been uh, tagging also my heart that these teachings are not, they are more for, they are for a purpose. What is the purpose? Transform our heart and renew our minds. So we are not going to use these um, teachings to acquire knowledge and shoot ourselves in the foot. So that when people are talking, we come and recite you Bible verses. No, it is meant for our growth. Just like Apostle Paul said, now is touching things offered unto idols. We know that we have knowledge, knowledge perfect, but charity edified. Charity, which is the love. Knowledge goes down to the grave, but love will go up where it belongs to God. So God, in effect, is graciously released to us what we need to mature in Christ Jesus so that we can function as his sons here on this earth. 
we need to function as sons of God on this earth. That's why at times we are being referred as ambassadors of Christ. Because we represent him or we are supposed to represent him. So there should be no doubt in our hearts or those when we have taken the word of God to heart and meditate on that word. That the ultimate state of redemption is for us to represent our heavenly father here. When people see just like in Antioch where the people were first called Christians, they saw something in them that even those people did not see. They said they are like him. They are like him. They said who? Say Christ. They started calling them Christian. So at times the light in us reflects. We don't know we're giving light to others. So to function less than this spiritual state and stature is to despise the great grace which we have been given by the Lord Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. He is the closest that we have, the one who represents us, the one who knows us better. No man can represent us. No, there is no other person who can stand. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no mediator between man and God. There is only the Lord Jesus Christ. Sadly enough, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been replaced in the church. We have taken his place because we take the places of men. The Bible call on sonship to grow is clear and very unambiguous. What do we mean? We are to lay hold of the master plan handed to us by our heavenly father. Heavenly father has given us a plan and he has bestowed his love on us, on us that we call him Abba Father. We are ordained as sons to make the will of our father our dwelling place to be used by the Holy Spirit to enforce his will on this earthly realm. To be used, not abused, Holy Spirit uses when we allow him to work with us. When we open ourselves for use, he uses us, but he does not force anybody. It is by so doing that we become uh, real instruments of advancing the kingdom of God and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only time we begin to grow. Is it true? Yes. John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, and they received him not. So the Bible said, but as many as will receive him, to them he gave them power to be the sons of God, even to them and believe it in his name. That's why God exalted his name above every other name. But at the mention of the name, Lord Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the sea. Everything must bow. That name is not only a magic name. When you use that name combined with the blood of Jesus, nothing on this earth can defend it. Nothing can stand the blood. Nothing can stand the name. Apostle Paul wrote again in um, Romans chapter 8, verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the sons of God. So the Bible makes it very clear that we were redeemed, that we were under the law, but he redeemed us and he called us to, to receive the adoption as sons. So God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. That's why we cry, Abba, Father. We are no longer servants. We are sons. And if a son, there is a difference. A servant is not entitled to anything. In your company, you are a servant, they cut you, they just dismiss you. Tomorrow to the next day, you are jobless. But if it is your father's company, they say, I am entitled to it. Whether we agree with me as a father or not, I am entitled to be here. There's no way he's going to throw me. He cannot throw me away. Where is he going to throw me away to? So it is very important that we grow because God worketh in us the will and to do his pleasure. And the Bible says, let us do everything without memories, without disputings. Let us be harmless. Let us be blameless as the sons of God. So that when people see us from outside, what do they see? Do they see him? Do they see Christ? 
That is what is very important. We need to portray our God, Christ Jesus. So as sons, we are called to be overcomers. Because why? We are going to inherit all things owned by our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it very clear. In whom we also have obtained inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worked all things after the counsel of his own will, his sovereign will. There was somebody who was asking me, a person, a minister of God, was asking me something. Just, just some, I was telling about the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, that God is not restricted in the box that we put him in. No. The, as expanse as the heaven is, and at that distance, how we cannot forget our God. So it's extremely important to understand. So no matter where we are in the life, in the journey of life or eternal life, there's always room for us to offer. There's always room for or need for us to press on and to live in the way that pleases our Father. So our salvation did not come in a very cheap way. No. He went to the cross. It was foreordained to produce a peculiar life, which reflects the fatherhood of God. He is holy, he is loving, he is powerful, which was transmitted to us by the precious blood. So the Bible makes it very clear. Our salvation, somebody went on to the cross, he received those big, big meals. It wasn't cheap. It was not enjoyable. The Bible makes it very clear that when you see him, we could not recognize he was despised. He was despised. So we are the elect of God. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and splitting of the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. We need to grow. The Bible makes it very clear. We need to grow. The mercy is enough. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect. In your weakness, says the Lord. There is no situation that the Lord cannot heal. There is no situation that the Lord cannot touch. So he makes it very clear to us. He is willing to go that extra, extra mile. That's how we grow as Christians. That's how we mature. Because we are talking about maturity. We need to mature. We need to grow up as Christians. Why is it important for us to grow? It's very important for us to grow. We were given um, an invitation to the Lord Jesus Christ. He visited the seven church ages. The last few days, we were doing the church, the seven churches. We did Smyrna, Pegamos, Philadelphia, we'll cover the other four. So he gave us an invitation to overcome. So the Lord is still speaking to us, even in these days, last days, with a lot of clarity. There's no ambiguity. The Lord does not speak with a forked tongue. So no matter the present state, uh, the present state where we are as saints now, he has not given up on any. He has not. That's why the Bible says there is no knowledge in grave. As long as you are living here for hope, a living dog is better than a dead lion. You are better than the president who passed away. He has not given up on us. Rather, he is calling us through an invitation to overcome and walk with him as sons. That is the invitation. That is the challenge. Is it true? Yes. We saw it when he approached the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians, in Revelation chapter 2. He made it very clear. You know, when God speaks, he makes it very clear that he wants us. It, it takes no pleasure in the death of a sinner. The Bible makes it very clear, and it means exactly what it says. So he said in the book of um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, when he was talking about the church of Ephesians, when the Lord was introduced, I was, when, I was, when I did the three previous teachings, he said he was being introduced as one with living. 
the same introduction, he, he said, I am the one who was dead and now forever, alive forevermore. He spoke a lot of things in that in those short verses. He said, him that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand and walketh in the middle of the seven gold, gold candlesticks. So when he approached them, he said, I know thy works, I know thy labor, I know thy patience. I know how you cannot hear them that are prophesying to be apostles, prophets. There are many people who are claiming to be great men of God, but you have found them liars. That's God speaking. And he said, because you've got my patience, and for my name's sake, you have left, but you have not fainted. There is something that the Lord did. I think there's only one church that he did not, um, I think it's Marina, the suffering church, where he never gave a condemnation, so he just gave them um, encouragement because they were suffering. Their properties were looted because of it's part of the persecution. They could not do business with the other people because why they said you are preaching. They don't mingle with us. So they become poor. Not that they only came from poor backgrounds, no. So here the Lord is telling us that you have labored and you have not failed it. That's why we have got only one eternal hope. That on that day, if the Lord, if mercy upon us, he will say, welcome my daughter, welcome. And he said, I've got something against you. He, I have got something against you. In every church where he went to, he gave them, said, you mentioned the things that they are going through. And when he mentioned these things, there was something very significant when the Lord was approaching the churches. He would tell them their present state. So he said, remember where you have fallen and do the repentance, which is the entry, which is the benchmark of the entry into the kingdom of God. And do the first works. What is the first way, first way to come back to where you received the Lord? Where you received the Lord. He said, because why? Or I'll come quickly. I'll remove that light that you're using to see. Except you, you, you repent. He said, he commended for them something. Up. He said, he also hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, that is the same doctrine of Balaam. Number, 20, number 23 to 25, where Balak and Balaam met the king and the prophet. He was asked to curse the Israelis. He said, he tried it, he could not. He tried it, he could not. He said, I've got to bless them. So this man, being a prophet of God, they were very good friends. He said, okay, let us go and drink some coffee. As they were taking their coffee, eating their biscuits, the prophet of God told the king something. He said, my friend, I'm going to give you this kingdom principle. If you want God to give, you cannot test anybody that God is blessing. You cannot do it. He said, how do you do it? He said, you let them fall into the sin. I said, it was called the doctrine of Balaam. The Nicolaitans, they had the same principle. They said, now start sending your girls to fetch firewood to do their shopping in that next location. Because they were fair, they were beautiful. They begin to see them. And the young man said, you know, I want, I want to marry this one. I want to marry this one. That's how they were corrupted. And God removed himself from them. So what, what is the Holy Spirit saying? They say, him have got an ear, yet him hear. This is a very significant statement. Him, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. So if you overcome, I'll give you the gift from the tree of God. That is the promise of the Lord here. I'll give you to eat from the tree of life. There is overcoming to be done. It's not, it's not a walk in the park. Not a walk in the park. There is work to be done. It must be. The church of Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, he said, write these things. He introduced himself. I like this powerful statement when I was quoting um, Isaiah chapter 44, verse um, 5 and 6, where he said, I am the first and the last. And he came again and confirmed the same thing in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. He said, he put the three of them together. I am the first and the last. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Confirming that he 
answers the name of God. Jesus Christ is God. He is not only the son of God, but the perfect uncreated light of God. He is uncreated. Don't hear what those people, theologians come and tell you, said, no, he was created. Where was he when he was creating the world? He created the world. He did it for his own pleasure. We owe him. So he said, when he was introducing himself, he says, these things said the first and the last, which was dead, meaning that death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. And now he's for life, alive forevermore. The same way that we see, say, my redeemer liveth, because he is alive. He is alive. He answers prayers. He rules in the affairs of men. No matter what situation, the Lord can come into that situation. Oh, yes, he does. No matter what we can, what the um, arrows the devil um, throws at us, yes, he can. He can. So he told them something. He said, I know your works, I know the tribulation. This is the suffering church, church of Smyrna. I know the blasphemy of them, those people that call themselves Jews, but they're not, they are on synagogue of Satan. The greatest persecution has always come from the church. You will not hear a, a Muslim coming to persecute, no, no. If something happens to you, they are happy. But the ones that persecute are always the ones inside, the very nice ones which I think is bad. So the Lord said, I know what you're going through, but don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. He said the devil is going to thrust some of the people into prison because he's talking about overcoming. We have to, that message was a message to every church. We have got to overcome. So he said some people will be thrown into, um, into prison for 10 days. The 10 days, which I think according to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastic um, early church writers, writers, I think they were looking at a span of over 250 years in which the church was being persecuted. It's not literal 10 days, it's in 10 days. It doesn't make any more value than what the Lord is sparing from us. But all the same, just for clarity purposes, it's not a period that is written as 10 days from this day to the next week, counting like difficult days. It's a period spanning several days, several years. The 10 periods, this was the year. This is how the years were counted then. So what did the Lord say? He, he that had an ear again, let him hear what the spirit says. He that overcome it shall not be hurt by the second death. Revelation chapter 21 verse eight. You will not be hurt by the second day. It's not going to have any hold upon you. It's not going to, nothing is going to hurt you by any means, said the Lord. Then the church in Pegamos, the church in Pegamos, which is, uh, let us, we did a teaching about it. It's one of those churches that we teach, Philadelphia, Pegamos, and Smyrna. We'll be going with the other churches at our program next week. And he said something significant when he came again. I want you to see something how the Lord is being introduced. He said, him that comes with a sharp sword, a sharp, a sharp sword with two edges, he's being introduced again. Remember, he's the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is a double-edged sword. Speaking because he is the word personified. So he's coming again. When you link it to the word, you begin to see, said, oh, why was he using all these titles? He is coming in as the owner of the church. He's not coming to, he's not coming to ask me what is the state of my church. No, he is coming and tell me, say, I am the owner of the church. But as much as he's telling his people, I'm telling you as the leader of this church. You are the one that I put, to, I, I put in this church. I want these things to be addressed. I put you in charge for a purpose. If you my grace, do you have the courage to move my work forward? So he said, he knew their works again. And he said, do you know even where, this, where the devil sits? When I did this teaching uh, some two weeks ago, it's not like where the seat of Satan, this was because of um, the idols, the gods they were worshiping. 
that is where Satan went, Satan was. That is the seat, it's not like the seat of the devil is in the devil. Antipas was um, one of the faithful believers who was murdered, he was the first one to be killed. Why he refused to repeat the Lord. There was one man, I think in the church of Smyrna, one uh, bishop, after serving the Lord for over 70 something years, they said, can you renounce him? He said, I have served this man faithfully. He has not forsaken me. Why would I forsake him? The man stood and said, I cannot forsake him. I know what he has done for me. These were very telling words for somebody who they were pointing a gun, putting a very big um, machete upon his neck. If you misbehave, I'm going to cut your neck the same way that the Muslim does. Chop your head off like that. He said, no, I will not. People were crying. That's it. They said, just renounce him. Do you want to die? I was still going to die. One way or the other, you are still going to die. But what? If you are killed for the gospel, no matter how sinful I am, I can say, God, if mess upon me. The only thing I can ask for a minute to pray in my heart, Lord, if mess upon me, give me the grace of repentance. Every sin that is holding me or standing against me now, please may you wash it with your precious blood. As you said in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 19, you will have mercy upon you, you will have mercy. Have mess upon me, Lord. He said, I'm done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to renounce him. They kill you. If you are lucky, if God said, God said, I will have mercy upon whom I left mercy. The thief at the cross, he said, can you remember me in when you enter the kingdom? He said, yes, verily, verily, I tell you today, you will be in my father's paradise. Who knows? If you are given that grace, you can be given that grace. That's the kind of grace that we pray for as Christians. So it's not a question of coming in um, um you know, we need this grace because we are tempted at times. These people, they kill. Now they've got this, um, they are no longer addressing Mr., Mrs., this. Now they are saying others. There are some men who are refuse, refusing to be known as men. There are women who are, who wants, who wants not to be known as women. So they are now putting a title, open title. But this is the fight against God. The one that created, can we talk back to our creator? When you created as a woman that I can now call myself a woman, no. When you created as a man that you're calling yourself a man, but when you're a woman, transgender. Now see, just see the evil cruelty which is happening. Young girls that you're competing in sports, they're beating thoroughly. I just change my, I just come in and say, now I'm a woman. My name is Kenny. I start running. Before you know, I get a few million dollars. That's what I feel. I feel I'm a woman, not necessarily a woman, but it disadvantages those women that have been training. Now they're getting all the medals. Is that what we want for our children? Is that how we confuse them? That's why the church has got a job to do. Teach our children at home to start taking notice of the vices of the evil one. It's coming more like through civilization. We are not condemning because it says that I take no pleasure in the death of a sin. Get us right. We do not condemn. We pray that every soul be saved, even though we know it's not possible. If in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, not everybody was. He did not raise everybody from the dead. Those that were meant to perish, they went to perish. Remember when that woman came to him, he said, Ah, why should I give food for the children with the dogs? It was the pastor of a church calling him somebody a dog. Do you think he will go back to that church? No. What did he mean? You are a pig, you are a dog. If, if you were not in faith, that's how the Jews used to refer the people. The infidel. You are not, you are not in the faith. The things that the Muslims now are using say, if you are not in our faith, you're an infidel. So the Lord Jesus Christ, because he said, he has got this sharp sword um, with two edges. What did he say? He said, I know your works. And I know where you live, where the seat of the devil is. So, why was the Lord saying it? Because he said something. This Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, that is the one that captures the whole thing that happened in Numbers chapter 23. Where that king sacrificed his firstborn son 
Can you imagine that sacrifice for evil? Israel was beaten thoroughly, like blue and red, they were defeated. So God said, if he can sacrifice his firstborn son, what will you sacrifice? Said what? There is a price to be paid. There is a price to be paid. So these are the things that the Lord said. He said, but I've got a few things against you. That was why you hold the doctrine of Balaam. He have taught Balak to be a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat unto the sacrificed uh, idols, sac um, food sacrificed unto idols, and commit fornication. Like I said, fornication comes from a Greek word before, which is called poneo. Poneo is just a blanket term for all uh, immoral, sexual immorality. And you are saying, you also have got the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I heard, which he mentioned in the Church of Pergamos. But he said, I'm going to fight them with the sword of my mouth. Remember when he's coming, he is going, the book of Jude said that thousands upon thousands, these are millions of people that are coming. Probably they will spend two days coming when they are coming. Those that will come initially will come with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's coming with the words from heaven. He's bringing an army, he's leading them where the devil will be, kept, will be captured by one angel and put in captivity for 1,000 years. There will be relative peace, even according to the book of Zechariah. Those that refuse, there are people who are going to refuse to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will refuse to bow down. People will be going to Israel when they meet a Jew, say, bless me. He is coming, when he's coming, he's coming to save the Jews. Now this is our time for him to save us. He is coming for the Jews, the ones that rejected him before. That's why they are going to be in tears when he comes. At the time when Israel wants to be destroyed, I don't know whether the nuclear weapons or whatever, they said over millions and millions. We, we presume, according to the studies which have been done, the Chinese, the Russian, the East, the Iran, everywhere, they will gather in that battle, in that um the Megiddo, this battle of the hills. It is at that point that the heaven the realms will check it. Darkness will be everywhere so that this light is going to shine. Before they know what is happening, you will see the whole world. Like he said, you will see me as you will see a, um, a lightning from the east to west. Everyone is going to see it. It is on rapture that no man is going to see him. As he appears, he is going to appear in glory. Kings of the earth are going to run away. Presidents are going to run away. Hide me. Mountains are going to flee from his presence. Everything is going to run because it's going to come in pure, in holiness, in righteous, in, in dead judgment. At that time, he appears, the Lord, the Israel, the Jews are going to say, our Savior has come. The Messiah has come. They will cry, the Jews. That is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. So this is what he's saying. By the way, say, I'll fight them by the sword of my mouth. It is by the brightness of his coming and by the sword of his mouth that the devil will be defeated. He will be captured by one angel, not many angels, one. One angel is going to take him, put him in the sea. That's um, the, yeah, that's it. this is why the Lord is saying, by the word of my mouth, he is going to pronounce that word. Let's give you some of those things. When you see the events which are happening now in the world, it's aligning. I don't want to, to, to preach politics, but at times we cannot quite ignore some of those things. I think um, without exaggeration, this could be the beginning of the fall of the American dollar. It will come. When people begin to start moving away from that dollar, they are going to float that dollar to America. Baby. There will be so much money just in little bit, few goods. That is the book of Revelation said that they, you will be working the whole month, you will buy probably food that is worth for two or three days. It's going to come. The decay, the rot, everything is that all systems have failed. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ himself is coming. The system men have failed. So he said, I'm going to fight them with the word, the sword of my mouth. 
I am coming to you. He that have gotten ear, let him hear. To him that overcometh, I will give him to eat the hidden manna and give him a white stone and a new name written which no man knoweth except him that is going to receive them. This is a firm promise. He, him that have got an ear, yes, have got an ear. You listen, but did you hear? When he said hear, there's a difference between listening and hearing. Hearing, you listen and then do that which has been asked, commanded of you. That's where the, that's where the aspect of hearing comes in. Now we'll move to the other church, Aitira. He came again into the church of Titus. He said, the son of God, who has got eyes like under the flame of fire, his feet are like a fine brass. So when he came in like this, this was John the Revelator was being shot in by the angel. He said, listen to him. This is the son of God. He moves in the flame of fire. Remember, um, it rose in the face of men. When he appeared to the three Jewish boys and thinking Daniel chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. When they were thrown into the furnace, which was seven times, seven times from the normal, what happened? They said, even if God cannot save us, but we are not going to renounce our faith. That statement challenged Lord Jesus Christ. Come down in person. He said, I'm not going to send my angel. No, I will descend in person. As they were thrown into that fire, he came in himself. That's why I said, he has got eyes like unto a flame. The king stood up like this. He said, how many people did we throw in here? They said, the three. He said, I'm seeing one like son of God. He could not describe him because was, his spiritual eyes were opened. For the glory of God. He said, what? When he looked at him, he said, we put three people. There are four inside them to come out. This is the fire that killed the people who threw them in into the furnace. Just imagine, the fire was heated of a thousand degrees. No man can survive it. No man can survive that kind of fire. But it was heated over seven times. The people who threw them, the soldiers who threw them in, some perished from the same fire. But when they came out, not even, not even a smoke, not even nothing. They came on just like this. And he said, now, I now know your God. I now fear him. I fear your God. So he was being introduced now because his eyes, flame of fire. And he came again, he said, I know your works. He is coming to this church. He is coming to CHMI. I know your works. I know your love. I know your love. You save your love, your faith. I know your patience. But what do you have to do? He said, but now I still have got a few things against you. Few things against you. Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who called herself prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat. Being sacrificed unto idolatry. Idolatry, basically, I have defined it a number of times, giving divine honor to created images. That is basically the definition of idolatry. One that Apostle Paul wrote in um, Romans chapter 1, verse 24 to 25, who um, changed the truth of God into a lie. That the creature is the, the creature is now demanding to be worshipped. We change the truth of God into a lie. We see people kneeling down before. No, it's not supposed to be. One angel, when John the Revelator, the beloved, knelt down before the angel, he said, stand up, stand up. I'm a fellow servant. He knew no man can take the glory of God. Don't allow somebody to kneel down for you. Heaven will be waiting. No, no matter what, even if they stole something from you, when they kneel down, he said, no. Stand up. Those that know if you want to provoke the wrath of God, because you are sharing in his glory. So what, what, what was he saying here? He said, I know this woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach. A woman symbolizes the church. 
the church. To teach and seduce my servants. Many servants of God, the doctrine has been watered down, has been compromised. Some have been put into different positions. So it's extremely important what the Lord was saying to the church. He said, I'm giving you time to repent. I've given a time to repent of this fornication. I've repented not. What am I going to do? He said, I'm going to cast you in your bed, then commit adultery with you in the great tribulation. Except you repent of your deeds. Tribulation is going to come, then there's the great tribulation which the Lord Jesus Christ said, unless and until the days were shortened, not so was For the elect, those days were shortened. He said, I'm going to kill their children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who set the reins and hearts, and I'll give to every man according to your works. The same thing that was said in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. He said, who can understand the heart? I'm just paraphrasing it. Who understands the heart? The heart is desperately weak. They say, I, the Lord, searches the heart and try the reins. I'm going to give every man according to that which he has done. That's why the Lord is speaking to us. So in every church where he went to, I want you to notice one thing. He that overcome it, we have gotten overcoming. So he said unto you and the rest in our Thyatira, as many as have not heard this doctrine and which have not known the depth of the devil, he is saying now, I'm ready. Are you ready to hold fast till I come? Are you hold to endure? Are you, are you ready to have the patience? And he said, he who that overcame and keep my works unto the end to him, I'll give power over the nations. When you hold on to the end, the challenge is, are we given sufficient grace to hold on to the end? Are we given sufficient grace to hold on to the end? And you shall rule. You say, we Christians, we are going to rule this world. Yes, of course. So he said, if you overcome, he that overcome it, it keep my works unto the end. It's not how we start the time, it's how we finish that determines where we will spend our life. Then there's this church in Sadis. Church in Sadis. And he came back again, introduced again. He's being introduced. That is where the seven spirits and the seven stars. He said, I know thy works. You have got a name. I know, I know you as CHMI. People say you live, but you are dead. I know you as this church. I'm using ourselves that's that is the name of the church that we can relate to. I know you are doing programs. I know you are giving this. Yes, that is for the people to see. Are we going from babyhood to sonship? If we don't grow, we start hey, We have got to grow. This is the message we are giving ourselves. To. So he said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found that way works perfectly before my God. I have not found anything perfect. I do not find anything of me in you. That's where the sanctification comes in. Sanctification basically means how much of Christ has been formed in. How much have you allowed the Holy Spirit to move and fall mold you into the likeness of Jesus? How much percentage were you given? That when he looks at you, say, do I see something of me in this person? If he says, no, I do not see anything that connects us. So he said, be watchful, be very careful, take your time. The Nigerians say, take your time. Take your time when you're doing this thing. Say, take your time with me. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found their works perfect. We talked about works when I was teaching about the authority of God, faith and works. Remember how therefore you have heard, received and heard. Hold fast and repent. So repentance is the benchmark of entry into the kingdom. If you shall not watch, he said, I'm going to come if in the night, because you will not know of the hour that I come. There's something very interesting, you know, a thief. 
what do you think happened on the cross? There was a thief ready that thief went to heaven. He said, I'm just coming like him as a thief. You don't know what time I'm coming. Because when that man was stealing, probably he said, ah, can you tell us when you're going to steal, what time do you go and steal? Everybody's sleeping in their kids, in the, dead in the sleep, probably 2 a.m. When everybody's dead asleep, that's when they will do their operation. He said, I'm going to come like that, he said. He said, you've got a few names in studies which have not defiled their coming. Me in white, but they are worthy. There are some who have sold the uh, time, the test of times. And he said, he that overcometh the, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, in white gowns. And I will not blot out your name out of the book of life. And I will confess you before my fathers and before us. That was the Lord Jesus Christ speaking again. So you can see, as he was approaching the churches, he was coming, telling them things. This is what I see. This is what I see. You have got room to do something. You can change. He did not come to discourage. These were the love letters that he wrote to the church to see where we are. Because we have constructed God to be a God who is willing to punish people. It's a distant God that has led us to be trapped in the um, babyhood syndrome to the church in um, Philadelphia, which is the sixth church in Philadelphia. He said it's the church in Philadelphia. He, that is holy. <laughs> I wanted to see something. He is being introduced here. It is the angel say, him that is holy, he, him that is true, he that is has got the key of David, the faithful one. The, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. He said, when he opened the door, no man chatted. When he chatted, no man opens. He was introduced as holy, as true, and faithful. When he says something, it happens. And he came back again to this church of Philadelphia. He said, I know your works. He challenged them, I know your works. I've said before they an open door and no man can shut it because they've got little strength. You have kept my word and not denied my name. How do we deny the Lord? The time to deny him in our works in the way we walk with him. But he said, Behold, I'll make them for I'll make them for synagogue of Satan, which they which people who claim to be Jews when they are not. There are people who are claiming to be Christians when they are not. They can take it loosely to be like, you come to church for ritual purposes to soothe your conscience as um, you want to tell God, you say, God, but I was going to church, I was doing it. Yes, how much would you pay for the breath that you are getting from me? So no man can stand before God and tell him, God, but I was coming to church, I was helping the poor. Yes, it was good. That's why I gave you, you were supposed to die at the age of 40, at the age of 45. Now I gave you extra 50 minutes. Now we are 50 seconds. Do you know when you're supposed to die? I said, no. For those things that you are doing, but they don't qualify you to enter here. Nothing unholy can enter into my place. That's why the Lord they repent and pray for grace. He said, you have kept my word, my patience, and I'll keep you from the hour of temptation, which is the great tribulation which will come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That is very, very powerful statement where people were saying um, uh, tribulation, tribulation. That's one of the Bible verses where you see the Lord was saying, when he said, I'll keep you from, because you have kept my word of patience, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation, which is the tribulation. I don't know, some people can interpret it different. We have got different interpretations. But the Holy Spirit is generally the final at the data for or the final interpreter of the scriptures. But that will be my understanding. But yes, that are those that are supposed to be captured. There are some Christians that are going to remain whose faith is going to be tempted. You don't renounce Christ when you are not a Christian. These are not nominal Christians. These are Christians who um, um these are practicing Christians. But how, how, um, how far are we going to overcome? How far are we going to hold our faith? 
They said, behold, I come it quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that no man may take your crown. And he said, him that overcame it again, I will make you the, the pillar in the temple of my God and shall go no more out. And I'll write the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is Jerusalem. So God is promising people things here. He is saying, I know what you're going through. So we are going to the seventh church, Laodicea. These churches were found in the present day Turkey, which which they used to call Asia Minor. And he said to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right, the thing said the amen. Amen is the name of Jesus Christ. You see what the Bible is saying? These things say the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. You can see the name amen. Don't pray with amen. I'm going to drink 10 years to just say amen. You are blaspheming God. This is the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Stop abusing the name of God. This is a simple definition if you see. These things say the amen, the faithful and the true witness. Who is the true witness? Who is the beginning of the first creation of God? The perfect uncreated light of God, the amen. The Bible makes it very clear. According to this statement alone, we can write even books about it. These things say to the amen, who the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that you are neither cold nor hot. These people, they were living in a city like a hill. There was no water. So they used to take their water from somewhere. They used to pump water to bring it into the city. As they were bringing water into the city, when it came in, it was neither cold nor hot. So that was lukewarm. So he said, I know it works. That you are neither cold. You are compromising. I'll spew you out. The Greek word, he said, I'll spit you out of my word. That's the equivalent of the Greek word when you, when you, listen, when you look at the correct translation, the Hebrew says. They will tell you, said, yes, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I'm rich and peace with goods and have no need for nothing. Say, oh, yes, you have. But you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, you are naked. This was the Lord telling them. You think of what a car is. You think of what this is. No, at the poorest amongst them, you are miserable. You are wretched, you are blind, you are naked. Said, what if in Naba? was called a fool by the Bible when he was employing several employees. I think during that time, he had more than 20, 30 seconds waiting for him. He said, sir, I want this. He said, yes, but the Bible called him a fool. So it's not that you're driving the car that makes you wiser, no. The other Bible term, especially in the book of uh, Proverbs, is simple, it just means, simple was the word for foolish people in the Bible or fool. You know, during that time, they try to be polite that we don't offend the people. That's why he say, that's why they were being called the simple ones. Just a polite term for those. But they are the simple ones. So the Lord said, because they were claiming that they are rich. And now he said, you know what? I give you a try. If you can sell. Buy of me the gold that is tried in the fire. That you can be rich and you come and put on a white coming that you may be clothed, clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And then he said something, that's the amount of thine eyes. They used to make um, eye ointments in this place in Laodicea. So they were known for medical uh, privacy. So he said, <laughs> he said, and anoint thy eyes with the arms of sorrow that you may see. So he used to use things that they were saying, Remember, I said, yeah, look what your water that is coming from there, you see, it, it, it's neither hot nor cold. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, he uses the people in Satanism. They were, they were too cold against him. He said, why, why would I not use this one? This one, that walk in the middle, you know, they look not to offend anybody. He said, no, this one's I don't need. I want somebody who can stand for me, for my truth. That's why he chose Apostle Paul and made him one of the greatest. And he said, as many as I love, I rebuke and trust him. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repentance again, why it is the benchmark of the entry into the kingdom. 
They say, behold, I send it to a knock. He is knocking in the churches. People are singing, people are dancing. The owner of the church is knocking. Open the door. No, we don't know this, uh, let us enjoy. This is in the church. Programs are going full um, head on, but nobody's doing anything. Nobody's doing anything. And he said, if you open the door, I'll come and give dinner with you. And you also have dinner with me. So he said to him that overcometh, I'll grant him to sit with me in my throne. If in, if in him as he overcame and sat down in, with his father in, the, in his throne. And the Bible said, let him who have gotten ear, hear. Hear. So what are we saying? The final word. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, the one that leads to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. They say, all the abominable, all this. Let us read it together. Revelation chapter 21. It says, He that overcometh, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the warmongers, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the second death, in the lake which beneath the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So here he say, if you overcome, you shall inherit all things, all these things, and I shall be your God, and you shall be my son. Remember, he is now saying the Lord Jesus Christ, like I told you before, um, I did some teachings several months ago where I was showing that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. He said, I will be your God and you'll be my son. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are called the sons of God. So Jesus Christ became the son of man so that we can become the sons of God, adopted into his family in this earth realm and in heaven with the hope of eternity wired into our identity. We are conscious as we are living First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. We are sojourners. We are passing through. We are pilgrims. We are pilgrims. We don't live forever. So we cannot refuse so great salvation by staying in the shallow waters of arrested babyhood, orphanhood, servanthood. People just say, I mean, what can I do? I don't know what to do. Ah, God has let me like an orphan. No, we are not an orphan. This is why the Bible, the Bible, people are not teaching, people are not being taught the correct principles in the Bible. We are called to be sons. We are called to be joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord gave his word, and, the, and great was the company of those that published it. Praise the Lord. So with this, I wish to tell us that he that overcometh shall inherit all the things and I shall be God. May the Lord bless us hearing this message. May he continue to strengthen us, to strengthen us in the mighty name of Jesus. Offer to you. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for his word that has come.